Shen, hello, good afternoon, evening, whatever. It's still afternoon, isn't it? I'm so confused. Um, so, uh, yes, I think you know everything you need to know about me from that introduction. I do talk to a, a very wide range of sectors, that's, that's very true. But mainly, I talk to, um, uh, well, we don't want to call people consumers, active citizens who are also consuming, because I would rather be on that side of the fence than the people who live on less than a dollar a day, which is obviously... Uh, uh, predominantly the case uh, in um, many developing world countries. So I make no apology for being a consumer because I'm very lucky that I am one, but I do try and consume in a, in a positive and responsible way. And I suppose my work really, um, I write for The Observer magazine uh, and The Guardian, and I suppose what I really am is an eco-agony aunt. So people send me their problems. A lot of them, to be completely frank with you, are about recycling. And I don't do one about recycling every week because I would get fired because it would be so boring. So I try and spread it around a lot. But one of the things we always come back to is design. And I'm absolutely passionate about sustainable design. I love working with designers and makers because I think you, and I, there's probably a lot of designers and makers here, uh, are naturally problem solvers and naturally uh, innovators. And that's really what it takes to be sustainable. And that's what it takes to solve a lot of the problems that we are are now facing. Everything became uh, sort of 400% more difficult yesterday for obvious reasons. Um, so the uh, misogynist reality star bankrupt, uh, sorry, I mean president-elect Donald Trump has just made sustainability a really, really, really problematic issue because I can tell you right now, this man who does not believe in climate change, he's a climate change denier, um, he's going to be in charge of the EPA, the Environmental Protection uh, Authorities, and from everything he's said so far, I mean, he has said a lot of bonkers stuff, uh, he's going to repeal climate change targets and he's going to ramp up fossil fuel production, which is interesting considering we're in a time of peak oil. Anyway, good luck to him with that. Obviously, I'm a huge fan. So, welcome to the Anthropocene. I just thought I'd give you a little bit of context uh, before we hear from our experts. So we have actually, I mean this is quite a considerable achievement, we've actually managed to shift epochs from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. Now what this means is that our actions, our human actions, are actually changing the biosystem. So they are changing the life-sustaining uh, resources that we all rely on. And we've never had this much influence. So that's one way of looking at it really positively, you know. So we know, we know that we've got a lot of influence. Um, so essentially what this means, that what we do, and, and Ghislaine just sort of articulated this actually, what we do in the next 50 years will influence the state of the planet for the next 10,000 years. Okay, so just to imbue you with uh, an even greater sense of responsibility. Thank you for coming, by the way, because actually engaging with sustainability and being here in the first place is really uh, a massive, massive step. So this is where we are, and this is why we need to start to think um, in terms of planetary boundaries. And a lot of you will probably be very advanced in thinking this way. I'm here to tell you that the consumer, even those lovely people that read The Observer, who are very learned and august people, they're not so advanced in their thinking about this. And that's why, in my role as an eco-agony aunt, I spend quite a lot of time restating the same things again and again and again. So it's very cyclical, and we have to keep going back to basics and we have to keep starting from the beginning and keep educating people because we are undoing 20, 30, 40, 50 years of uh, consumerism which has got ever faster um, and ever more uh, speeded up. Okay, so we're having to undo a lot of learned behaviours. So this is what this means. This is a WWF um, advert, which I really like. The future is man-made, and I think that's a really, really good way of putting it. Um, so, you know, we have an inherent responsibility to make sure that um, the, the stuff that we make uh, and the stuff that we use is sustainable. 
There's an obvious um, idiocy in destroying the things that we need to sustain us, but it is quite strange. And I wanted to talk to you briefly just about the messaging around sustainability um, and how we've kind of marketed green and sustainability and how lots of brands have used it. And a lot of it has been to do with these kind of quite um, uh, uh, Armageddon type kind of, you know, if you, if you abuse this, you're going to lose it. And... Um, we're all going to die kind of things. So I think it's really interesting when you look at b back at some of the early brand work when companies like Tetra Pak started to take very seriously, actually, the fact that the materials that go into Tetra Paks uh, were causing the destruction of uh, forests and that they were driving climate change. And they, they were kind of alert to this back in the 90s. And what they did was produce a series of TV adverts. I remember them being like the first adverts I'd ever seen, which were about the environment. And they were absolutely terrifying, like completely, completely terrifying. And there were all forests being raised to the ground and there were flames everywhere. And actually what this did was rather than um, alert people and galvanize them, was make people think, shit, this is so frightening and there's literally nothing I'm doing, I'm going to die. And it was actually completely disempowering. The advertisers learned pretty quickly and they started to... Um, think about um, how we brand environmental messages and change in supply chains in a different way. And I just wanted to talk to you very briefly about research that's just come out, um, which is about um, aspirational consumers. And this is quite good news, I think, because um, BBMG, uh, Globescan, all did a huge bit of research across about 50 countries, and they particularly surveyed I know probably everyone hates the word millennial, but the millennial audience, which is obviously a very, very important one for brands, and they found that sustainability was absolutely key to driving purchases, and I think that's very, very important. But people don't want to be beaten over the head with these apocalyptic messages, however apocalyptic the scenario gets. They want to be inspired and delighted, and I think that's a really, really important thing to hold on to. Okay, back to Mr. Trump. So this is the situation with climate change. It is a settled science. So you should be able to talk with absolute confidence uh, whenever you need to that this is a settled science and you have more um, evidence, more stats and statistics they are stats are statistics, stats than you ever need to um, ever need to shake a stick at. And this just gives you an idea of the IPCC reviewed uh, climate articles. Nearly 14,000, um, obviously, um, saying that climate change is happening in real, and 24 that reject global warming. So that gives you some idea of where Mr. Trump sits. It's insane, basically. Um, one of the things that I've done a lot of is look at consumerism in fashion. So fashion and textiles is where my kind of heart lies, really. Um, and there are several trends that we can identify over the last 10 to 15 years. This would be um, an example of mob shopping. So this is when the police are called and the ambulances are called and everybody is kind of, uh, there's a stampede because somebody hears that some, something's on sale for like a couple of quid. I think it's absolutely disgusting. I think it's really revolting. And I, can't, I think it's really inelegant. I think it's really kind of... Um, a situation that I never want to be in. And if I was making anything, if I was a brand, I would be absolutely mortified if people wanted to shop for it in that way. Um, and I think that it's, uh, for me, it's been a, a lot about following the trail of um, consumption and consumption trends. And especially with fashion, because what we've seen is that garments have been, have been turned really into almost like a fast-moving consumer good, which is indistinct from a bottle of shampoo. You know, we've seen price deflation, we've seen it speeded up, we've seen uh, the traditional seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter, turn into 52 seasons a year. Um, and that has had a really, really cataclysmic effect. And for me, it was 2013, the Rana Plaza collapse, when over a thousand garment workers were killed in one morning in one single production unit in Bangladesh which um, really changed things for me and really made me focus my attention on what sort of consumer I wanted to be and what sort of industry, because I love the fashion industry in many respects, what sort of industry I wanted to be involved with. 
Um, the other backstory for a lot of what we produce is obviously huge unseen pollution. We're still externalizing the true cost of production. And that goes for lots and lots of different materials and really all different sectors. The fa just to go back to fashion, the fashion, fashion industry is the second most polluting industry in the world after oil, which is incredible, absolutely incredible. But fabric has to be grown, it has to be picked, spun, gin, finished, woven, all of these different processes, incredibly polluting, and they use a lot of water. And of course, rates of disposability, absolutely pivotal when we're talking about sustainability, that we think about discard. Um, and I think we probably all know that our rates of discard, out of all food that's produced, one third basically goes in the bin. And that's when we have 800 million people uh, going hungry every day. Sorry, these are not very cheering statistics. So the, the question for me is, what do we do about it? And for me, the real heroes of this piece are the people who look at designing products and um, supply chains in a different way. I think that's really, really important. This is Helen Story's, um, uh, a piece by Helen Story, the fashion designer, uh, where she wanted to raise attention of the plight of refugees. Um, and there's some beautiful kind of elegiac work that's coming out of some of the alternative fashion industries. There are lots of solutions. So this is one of, of, about carbon capture. And there's lots of kind of um, fun, quite gimmicky, Heath Robinson kind of solutions around for, for things like climate change. And what, we, what we're really, really bad at, we kind of love all this stuff, and then we're really bad at things like the fact that if we really wanted to change, to shift the dial, we should tax people on meat and dairy. A new study from Oxford University said we should tax uh, meat by 40%, dairy by 20%, so that, so that producers would have to pay the real cost of production rather than just offloading it onto the planet. But of course, there's no appetite. Who want, if you go around and say, would you like to pay some more for your meat or your eggs and save the planet? Literally, nobody would want to. So that's the sort of quandary that we find ourselves in. There's other solutions like permaculture, which are slow solutions. So permaculture um, gardeners or growers will watch the land, and they might watch it for up to a year, so they know exactly how it works before they even plant. Can you imagine that in our kind of rapacious supply chain that we have now? So one of the things that I found out uh, recently is that my favorite soap opera, which is Coronation Street, is actually really, really green. And I'm fascinated by mainstream stuff that embraces sustainability and doesn't tell anybody about it. I think that is ultimately heroic. I think that's really, really kind of interesting and wise. So not very far from here, the whole studios uh, for Granada, for Coronation Street, have gone, or ITV Studios as they are now, has gone green. So they have uh, solar panels, uh, wind energy, LEDs in all the studios. Um, and I think that's kind of, these hidden stories are something that I'm really, really interesting in, interested in. Now, I want to very timidly out myself as a maker, um, because, and I do it in a very, very timid way, because I know I'm among professionals and very, very good standard of uh, making and craft here. So this is something that I've just done at Piccadilly Station earlier this week. If I look a bit tired, it's because you have to do your installation between one and five in the morning, because <laughs> it's a working station. And this is... Um, a project that we're doing where we're, we're doing a pop-up shop with London-made designers. Um, and we've worked with a brilliant, brilliant knitwear designer called Katie Jones, if you get a chance to look her up. And she really interests me because she applies a lot of traditional techniques and hand knitting with a lot of innovation and does these kind of spectacularly joyful projects, which no one could ever say were worthy or boring or dull. Um, uh, and another thing that I've also done is worked on a, a film called The True Cost, which is about the real production uh, cost of fashion as well. Um, and just to out myself further, I've got a little prop. Um, I'm very interested in why we make. And I wonder if any of our experts today can tell us a little bit more about that. I hope I can find her. But I have a little doll who's only got one arm. And... In fact, I have two, I've got three. The other, the other two have got their arms. And I make, wherever I am every day, I try and make them something to wear. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that she's naked out of whatever fabric or materials are around. And I don't know why I do it, but it just makes me feel better. It makes me more connected with the world. 
And I think that some of us just frankly need to make stuff. I'm not saying I'm very good at it, but um, I think some of us need to. And I think it's a reaction because um, one of my favorite poets is called Wendell Berry and he's from the US. He describes himself as an agrarian ph philosopher, which is quite some jo job title. And he talks about globalization. And what he says is that the way that we produce in a globalized economy in such a circumstance, he warns, the degradation of products and places and producers and consumers is inevitable. So I suppose what I'm saying is, by me making something, I'm trying to make that less inevitable. So we'll leave that there. That's me, and that's uh, hopefully a little bit of context. Um, but like I, I'd like to drill down into some of these ideas a little bit with our panelists.